Next speaker is Kai Branner, who's a researcher in Quantum Transport Group. And Kai is going to talk about engineering quantum devices, theoretical models for practical problems. Great, so thank you for the introduction and as Teko already mentioned, I'm a postdoc in the quantum transport group and I want to begin this little presentation with the simple question, what is quantum transport? Well, first of all, transport simply means moving certain objects from one place to another. Fair enough, for example, this impressive machine here was used 100 years ago to move people and goods across the Finnish countryside from one city to the next. That's concept we are all used to, it's what one could call classical transport. Now the device that you see on the right hand side of this picture, this one here, was manufactured 100 years later and is six orders of magnitude smaller in size. But still it serves essentially the same purpose. Specifically what this miniature machine here does is it makes it possible to control the exchange of single units of energy, so called quanta, between reservoirs that are no bigger than a few micrometers in size. And that's precisely what we refer to as quantum transport. Now I would argue, following um, Sabrina's outline, that both of these machines are part of a revolution. Yeah? One century ago, powerful trains were vital um, elements in building an economic infrastructure that then eventually carried the entire industrial revolution. And in a similar manner, we will need efficient strategies and devices to control the flow of particles and energy on micro scales between the individual components of quantum, complex quantum technologies. Now, what we do in our group is, can, ah, great. So this is our group, yeah, um, this is Christian Flint, our group leader. That's me and Pablo and our postdoc and our three PhD students. And what we do is we use elementary concepts from theoretical physics drawn from basic theories such as statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics in all its varieties, thermodynamics, dynamical modeling. We put together all these aspects. We spend a lot of time and coffee over them. Some do during the day, others do during the night. And if we are lucky, we hopefully end up with some practical results. Models that are able to describe the statistics of quantum transport devices that give us access to optimal control strategies or allow us to explore the fundamental limits of miniaturized quantum machines. Now what I want to do in the next um, 10 minutes, I want to talk a bit further about some examples of projects that have been carried out in our group during the last years to give you a bit of m more of an idea of what we are actually doing. And I want to start with counting. Now, counting is a ubiquitous and seemingly straightforward process in the macroscopic world. Yeah, we're counting everything every day. We're counting passengers on a plane, at least I hope the airlines do. Um, we're counting the calories we eat, we're counting our followers on Twitter, whatever. Now, in the quantum world, counting is a little bit more of a subtle task, because dynamical processes are usually not fully deterministic, but subject to intrinsic fluctuations. For example, if you would want to count the number of particles that are exchanged between two superconducting reservoirs, so objects that are in a fundamental quantum state, you need a machine like this one here, which was fabricated in the lab of Yucca Pecola a couple of years ago. And what this machine does is it makes it possible to count the number of um, entangled pairs of particles, so-called Cooper pairs, that are exchanged between two um, leads shown here. And schematically, this device works as illustrated in this um, figure here. So here you have the two leads, and these leads are connected to a metallic island via insulating barriers. And what we do in principle is we observe the charge of this island. It's a monitoring process, um, which can be realized in experiment with advanced technologies I don't know so much about. But in the end, what you get out is a stochastic trajectory, which looks like that. So essentially what you see here is the, the, the charge of the island as a function of time. And each of these um, oscillations here shown in blue corresponds to the exchange of a series of entangled pairs of particles. Okay, great. Problem being, these measurements can be carried out with sufficient accuracy only on relatively short time scales. But for practical purposes, we would also like to understand how this process 
um, can be described in the long run. And that's where our theory becomes helpful. So what we've done here is we set up a dynamical model for this system, and then we combine techniques from full counting statistics and a freshly developed method based on dynamical Liang zeros, put everything together, and you can think of this um, model as a theoretical machine. And what you have to do is you have to feed it with short time data which you gather in the experiment, and what you get is a prediction for the behavior of the transport process that this data was drawn from. And you see the result of this entire development um, summarized here in these two plots. So what these plots show you is essentially the logarithmic probability for the expert the large, the expert's large deviation function um, describing the current flowing between these two leads. Now the blue dots here correspond to the actual measurement results and the black line, which is underneath these blue dots, accurately matches these results is predicted, which it accurately matches these results as predicted by our model. So that's the short time regime, fair enough. But what you see on the right hand side, that's the um, exciting part, is the long time regime. So you see that our model makes it possible to predict to be the statistics of this device at very large times that are out of reach for any practical experiment at the moment. You can imagine that if you were able to carry out this experiment infinitely long, this entire line would be successively filled with blue dots. It's not possible in practice, but in theory we can do it. So the bottom line here is um, our modeling somehow makes it possible to predict the future of a quantum transport process from its behavior in the present. Now I want to move on to a second example, and that's cooling. Well, cooling devices are nowadays part of every well-equipped household. Yeah? Everybody has a refrigerator to keep food and beverages cool. Um, and these machines, yeah, they are around for a long time. They produce temperatures slightly above the freezing point of water. Now, if you want to go a bit lower, like slightly above the absolute zero, you need um, a machine which operates in a quite similar manner, but looks quite different. Yeah, I mean, here you see a dilution refrigerator, which is used in many laboratories in the QTF. Um, and the main message here is this is a complicated and massive machine. Yeah. So both of these machines essentially have the size of living human beings. Now in the future, we would like to have these devices miniaturized down to the scale of micrometers, yeah? Because if we want to apply quantum technologies um, in our everyday life, we also have to have cooling strategies that are compatible with this aim. Because most of the quantum devices we have require very low operation temperatures. And nobody would want to carry around such a thing just to use a quantum mobile phone, for example. So and that's where um, our next project started. Here you see again the picture from my initial slide. And this device, again, was fabricated in the group of Yucca Pecola and can be seen as an immediate predecessor of a quantum refrigerator. Schematically, it works as follows. You have a quantum engineered system, in this case a superconducting qubit. This um, system is connecting two reservoirs, a cold one and a hot one. And now you can externally control by applying magnetic fields and doing other things, the internal energy landscape of this system. And if you do that in the proper way, you can transfer heat in this system against its natural direction of flow. So from the cold reservoir to the hot reservoir. That's exactly what a refrigerator does, yeah? because the inside of the refrigerator is usually colder than the outside, depending on your outside. In Finland, it's not always clear, but anyway. Um, so that's the basic purpose of the device. And the natural question arising in this context is how can you control it in an optimal manner? Yeah, we have the option to control the energy landscape, but how do we do that in such a way that to get the maximum cooling power out or the maximum efficiency? Turns out that's quite a non-trivial task and it took us two years to figure that out. Um, we started with a basic theoretical model, which is illustrated here in the, uh, in the lower plot. So here are the two reservoirs. Here's our um, operating system and what we do is we decompose the thermodynamic cycle into two strokes. In the first stroke we pick up heat from the cold reservoir. In the second stroke we use mechanical power to eject this heat into the hot reservoir. Okay, well we take it from there, we put some equations on that, we make an accurate model and then we run the entire machinery of dynamical control theory which is quite complicated and you need a PhD student and a summer student who work on that for two years 
to do it properly. And in the end, what you get out is shown here in this plot. It's the optimal control protocol. Yeah. So this is the time. This is the the cycle time. It's periodic, and this is the your, your external control parameter. And you see, this is how you have to change your external control parameter if you want to get the maximum efficiency for a given cooling power. And what you see, it, it, it looks quite not trivial. Yeah? I mean, this is nothing one could have guessed naively. Um, even more, we don't only get the optimal control strategy, we also can now explore the limits of the device. Since we know how to control it in an optimal way, we know what is the maximum efficiency we can actually achieve at a given cooling power. That's what's illustrated in the right plot. And you see, okay, quite naturally, this is efficiency as a function of cooling power at the in the optimal stage of operation. And what you see is if you increase the cooling power, the efficiency goes down. And moreover, if we increase the temperature gradient, the efficiency goes also down. So this is this direction. It's quite natural, yeah? If we inc increase the temperature gradient against which the machine has to work, its efficiency goes down. So much for that. So we have, in the end, we have developed a practical hopefully experimentally realizable optimal control strategy for a quantum cooling device. Now I want to move on to my last example, pumping. Um, what is a pump? A general purpose of a pump is to use mechanical energy to transport matter. Like these fellows here extract oil from some underground reservoir using massive mechanical pistons. If you want to pump quantum objects, you can essentially apply the same type of operation principle, but you have to change your machinery a little bit. Um, and what you see here in the lower picture is a quantum pump um, that was manufactured in the QCD labs of Mikko Mertunen a couple of years ago. It consists of quantum dots, so tiny metallic units where you can confine single electrons. So electrons are the type of particles that we are interested in transferring here. And then you control, again, the energy landscape of the system using external voltages. Okay. Now, the aim of a quantum pump, I should say that, is not necessarily only to pump as many particles as possible, but you want to produce a quantized current. Quantized current means, in the ideal case, you would want to transfer exactly one particle per operation cycle. This operation cycle might look, for example, as shown here on the right-hand side, you have some yeah, you can think about it as a well potential. Then you, you load in some particle, then you increase the right barrier, and you eject the particle to the right. At different modes of operation, this is a two-stroke cycle, which is best operated in the fast driving regime. This is um, a four-stroke cycle, uh, where you vary two parameters, and this is works better if you do it slowly. But in the end, the idea is always the same. You trap a particle coming from one side, and then you e eject it to the other side using some um, input energy. Now, the question I arising again is, how can you control this device such that you produce a perfectly quantized current, so exactly one particle per cycle, and you also want to run as many cycles as possible per second. Yeah? So you want a quantized current, which is as large as possible. Here we go. Um, so this project was basically carried out by Elena, and who's also here and will present a poster tomorrow. Um, what we did is, again, we set up a dynamical model for the system. We applied methods from full counting statistics. These models are usually quite involved, but still we were able to explore the limiting behavior of the system quite accurately using dynamical expansion methods. And the final result is shown in the plots below. Here you have um, the driving frequency, so this is the number of cycles per second. And here you have the mean current that you're producing, and this line corresponds to one. So if you're here on this line, you have the perfect quantized current. And you see that we meet this condition exactly here on some plateau for some optimal frequency regime. And if you exaggerate with the, uh, with the frequency, this quantization mechanism breaks down. Same thing happens, at least for the one parameter pump, if you go to too low frequencies. Now, okay, what, what did we achieve here? First of all, we were able to predict accurately and in an analytical manner these breakdown frequencies. These are the dashed lines here. And since we were able to predict them, we also understood what parameters they actually depend on, and we were able to optimize this device. So we were able to shift these breakdown frequencies to the right and to the left, which means we could increase the size of the plateau and shift the plateau further to the right, which means we can now, if we operate this device in an optimal manner, 
get a larger and better quantized current than with a naive control protocol. That's the bottom line here. Um, the red curve, probably this one, um, corresponds to the optimized protocol here, and the blue one is some naive, naively chosen natural protocol. Okay, so bottom line is um, we found the limiting, or we explored analytically the limiting behavior of a quantum pump, and we were able to optimize the device using this model. So much for now. And that brings me already to my conclusion. So I hope I, hope I could give you some idea about what this um, diagram actually means and what we are doing. I should also say that these were, of course, only three examples for projects that we are um, were pursuing over the last years, and there are many more things going on. And our three PhD students, Elena Potanina, Aydin Dagger, and Paul Menzel, are all here, and they are presenting posters. And, of course, you're welcome to talk all of us, but I would especially invite you um, to meet um, these three people at their posters tomorrow to learn more about the things I told you and other things going on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I need to ask you the first question because I'm kind of, as an other theorist, I'm kind of jealous how you can connect uh, theories to r concrete practical problems. So how much these like, concrete practical problems motivate your research or is it also like, because you have many dynamical control theory, do you also get motivation from theory kind of independently and yeah, then sure. you combine them all? Sure, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is I think, a, a, a process of inspiring each other, yeah? So, I mean, the experiments that I've shown you, like, for example, I mean, in particular, this one here, that was directly conducted in connection with the people in Yuka's group. This project was actually motivated by a simple question that Yuka asked me two years ago, and said, basically, can you optimize this device? And I said, yes, sure, it takes one week, it took two years. Um, <laughs> and it cost a lot of a loss of manpower, but we arrived there finally. It's a process of, of, of inspiring each other. And also, I mean, this um, project is connected to the question, what is the fundamental performance limits of micros, uh, micro miniaturized sorry, um, thermal devices, which is a basic um, fundamental question currently attracting a lot of interest in the theoretical community. So these things are connected and they're interacting with each other all the time. Okay. Let's take a quick question. You discussed the long time scale statistics. In power spectrum, how would the noise look like? Any idea? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm interested in the one of noise problem, so I'm just so trying to I mean this is this is not only the noise, yeah, this is the entire large deviation statistics. Um Honestly, honestly, I wouldn't know now, because we never looked into that. But if it's something interesting, we can we can discuss later. Okay, that is a sauna discussion. Well, good. It's a sauna discussion. I mean, I'm honest here with you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, let's thank Guy again. This <laughs> nice talk. <laughs> <laughs>